It might be kind of expensive, though. But we'll see. Greetings, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Sit down, Reverend Mitchell. <laughs> All right. Sweet blessings to everyone. It is absolutely a marvelous Monday, and we're so glad to see everybody here. And as usual, such warm energy that everybody has, and so um, I'm glad to be in this uh, happy place with you. So we're going to open up with uh, prayer. Um, Reverend Mitchell will... Uh, He's, he's double duty today. He's going to do the prayer and an introduction for us. So, uh, Reverend Mitchell. Thank you so much, uh, Joy. Please uh, bow with us as we uh, invite God's presence to um, our assembly. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and humble our spirits before you in grateful appreciation for uh, another day. You know, sometimes we take it for granted, but it's a blessing to be here. We ask now that you would bless the food that has been prepared, may it nourish our bodies, but we also ask that you would certainly bless this gathering as we come together as concerned community uh, leaders and members to uh, see what the future of our city will be, particularly in our district and uh, throughout the city. So bless us and bless this day, bless this food, and bless our time together. This we ask in the precious holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you so very much. Well, um, so some of you are very practiced at hearing our wonderful um, history for the Lighthouse uh, Luncheon. Um, it was uh, started by a thought that came to uh, Floyd Wilson. Um, he was looking in the community and he was noticing an absence of... Uh, leadership and succession in the African-American community, he noticed that gap and he began to ponder what could we do about this. And so he decided to see a wonderful leader in our community, um, the late uh, Reverend Claude Black, and they had a discussion and said, well, let's see, what could we do? Reverend Black definitely agreed. He said, you know, with um, the upward mobility that we have now in our community, I mean, um, we're no longer centralized as we used to be. It used to be that we would all gather together and share information and mentor one another, but now everybody's so spread out. So how, what can we do? So they got the idea to have this luncheon. And so they brought in um, the late Ed Miles, who um, used to work for um, uh, District Attorney uh, Susan Reed, and they began having this luncheon. And I think they had it like, if I went one time, it was at Paisano's and a couple of different places. And then they finally settled on having it here at the Plaza Club. I think I came in maybe about six months after they started and started sending out the communications. And so we've been moving strong ever since. So we come together, not as an action group, but as an information group. We have wonderful speakers who come in and share great information with us, let us know what's going on in the community. Sometimes we have our elected officials, sometimes we have community leaders, um, sometimes we have business leaders giving us good information. And so while we are not an action group, each one of us <laughs> is responsible for action, right? So that this information you get here, what are you going to do with it? So are you going to go share it with someone else? Are you going to act on it? What are you going to do with that information? So, um, so we're so glad that you're here. And not only do we get good information that hopefully we can use to build our community and build lives, but also what a wonderful networking opportunity, right? We get to meet beautiful people and hopefully uh, find people that we can collaborate with and uh, do great things with, if, if nothing else but just to encourage them, right? To give them a smile and tell them, you can do it. I'm so glad to know you. What a beautiful person you are. So it's also an absolutely wonderful networking opportunity. So we're so glad that you're here. And speaking of networking, we're going to go around the room and let everybody introduce themselves. So if you could tell us um, your name and uh, maybe who you're with and what you do, but um, 
not not a not a book, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'll start with me because you know what I didn't introduce myself. I, I'm Joy McGee, and I um, am a small business owner here in uh, San Antonio, as well as I uh, hold different community leadership roles. And I'm very glad to uh, be able to lunch with you today. And I'm going to start off with you. Um, my name is Deborah Bush, and this is my first time, and I was invited. So. <laughs> Get a little fortress funding. Jackie Jackson, UTSA's Minority Business Center, and also I chair the City of Curry's Economic Development Committee. Regina Horn is free on a small business, but I also work at NLCS Academic Coordinator. Yeah, I'm San Bay Council on Call Drug Awareness. Charles Houston, Frost Bay Commercial Finance. Tony Hargrove, CEO, Ella Austin Community Center. Harold Foster, retired senior citizen. <laughs> Frank Dunn, Frank Dunn in turn, so you see. Milton Harris, small business owner, executive director of the 100 Black Men. Good afternoon, Cooper Ann Rector, um, senior citizen and community volunteer. Latronda Darnell Harris, I am government relations for the Texas Senate and Texas House. LeBron Witherspoon, retired military and CEO of the Texas Minority Fashion League. Rose Bean, retired military, um, CEO of the DET Enterprises in Crawford, and um, currently a real estate agent for um, EXP Realty. I'm Teresa Canales. I come wearing different hats, but this, uh, this month I'm here again with um, Mayor Ron Nuremberg's County. Paula Athman, native San Antonian, uh, uh, primary agent. Barbara Santos, retired. Barbara Santos, retired. Uh, Mary Lee Williams, owner of Majestic Events by Maria, as well as M2W Properties, uh, second vice chair for the Alamo City Black Chamber. Sure, Maria is the first vice chair for the Alamo City Black Chamber. Which and I are with Relations. Otis Mitchell, pastor of Mount Zion First Baptist Church, member of the Community of Churches for Social Action, and the Baptist Ministries Union. Uh, Laura Salas, former city councilman, uh, assistant professor of political science at the University of Texas, retired but not really. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Tony, city council candidate, District 2. Okay, and we have um, this beautiful young lady who just came in. Oh, I'm Lavonna Stewart. I'm with EXP Realty as well as San Antonio Association of Disabled. Glad to have you. And now, Miss Banks. Hi. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself? I'm catching y'all. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a member of Bethlehem Church, a um, member of the Dramatist Guild of America, and Delta Sigma Theta. And then. I'm Louie May Taylor, retired educator. And we're so glad to have now cast in our midst today. If you want to introduce yourselves. <laughs> I'm Charlotte Ann Lucas. I lead Nowcast SA, which remarkably is going to turn 10 years old this September. We're like local public television on the internet, or your local C-SPAN. Give you access. And this is... Hi, I'm Hannah Wolf. I'm an intern with the Students and Startups program. I'm currently a student at Trinity University studying English and Geosciences. So Nowcast has their um, information on the table, and um, they are uh, they do accept donations. They provide a wonderful service to us in the community. If you can't make an event, it might be some important information you need, and so you're able to access that because of uh, what they do. So we appreciate you. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Joy. It is with a great deal of pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce a member of my congregation, but also a, a uh, leader of our community. He is an honorable Mario Salas, and uh, he was a little bit, uh, I, I think, uh, shy in introducing himself a little bit earlier, but here are the things that I know about him. In addition to what he said, he is also uh, quite a writer and, and an editor, 
of uh, articles and books and newspapers. Uh, he is, as he said, a professor and a former district chief councilman, but he is also a historian, he's a Christian, he's a husband, a father, a grandfather, a political scientist, and a community leader. One thing you can always count on from Brother Mario is that he will give you uh, the straight up interpretation of what he sees happening in the community. He's not going to bite his tongue. He's not going to hold back. And uh, you will have no doubt where he stands and what he believes. Uh, that's a man you can trust because you never have to wonder what's going on. So uh, <laughs> uh, he told me, he said, be careful what you say. Uh, in introducing me. So, without further ado, I present to you our moderator, Brother Mario Salas. Thank you, Pastor Richard. And uh, I told him that because I didn't want to say nothing about what I just said or did anything. Um, anyway, um, we're happy to be here. And I uh, want to really thank Joy McGee for putting this stuff together. Give her a big round of applause. Well, we're honored today to have uh, two of the finalists. We went through, obviously, we went through a big um, with a lot of people running um, in the first round. They call that politics the first round. Now we're in the second round, and, uh, and that means a runoff. And so the runoff election is, uh, we have two days of early voting left uh, today, and I think it's uh, open until 8 o'clock tonight, and tomorrow, the same thing, 8 o'clock. And my, uh, well, I say not yet. You want to get that out of the way. Um, and, uh, you know, people are funny about that. A lot of people like to get it out of the way because, uh, who knows, you may not be available for a kid <laughs> on account of bad luck on the day of the election. So people want to do that when they, when they get it. And other people are what I call traditionalists. I'm going to vote on the election day and I'm not voting on the other day. And so you do that both ways. So those are the things that people uh, do when they and involve themselves in the political process. And we do live in a democracy, despite um, the fact that there are some people at the top that don't like that. Um, and you know what I'm talking about. Um, but we do live in a democracy, and so it's important that we hear from people who are running uh, to represent District 2. Uh, when I was a city councilman, and I know they're ready for this to be over. Uh, and look at their face, <laughs> their faces are terrible. Because once you've gone through the first round and the second round, it's, just, it's, it's hard work. Uh, you, know, you don't ever make everybody happy. It, 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 you know, that's just the way it is in politics. So you, you just have to do your best. So what I'm going to do is the way I'm going to organize this is I'm going to, we're going to have questions and stuff from the audience. And since we've got a relatively small group, well, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand for questions. But in the beginning, I'm going to allow each candidate uh, to come up and um, give about two minutes opening remarks. And I'll just ask the question of why do you think um, the community ought to vote for you for the District 2 City Council uh, spot? Go ahead. <coughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to have both of them come up, if you will, and uh, they'll raise the chair. I thought that was for something else. <laughs> and don't get my chair, it's in the middle. <laughs> and then I'm going to drag the mic over there, but i uh, point it. And I'll give each one of you two minutes, and you know, I'm old school, so I'm going to give, uh, unless she doesn't want to, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to give her a first shot at um, uh, the opening remarks. Then after they both give their two minute opening remarks, um, then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience. I think I might have a couple of questions myself, and I'll probably get mine out of the way right away, so y'all can have more time. So uh, having said that, uh, introduce, uh, I'll let her introduce herself, but I will say this City Council District 2 candidate in this runoff election, Jada Sullivan, so she can do the honors and uh, tell us all about herself. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor and a pleasure to be in front of you. 
and I stand in front of you as a lifelong resident of District 2. I was born here, raised here, raised my kids here, my mother's still here, my children are still at home, and yes, they are my little grown people because I say that because they're grown in number, but the things that they're doing makes mom proud. And so as I stand in front of you, I went to Gates Elementary School, went to Martin Luther King Middle School, and then I graduated from Sam Houston High School where I graduated with honors. Um, I became a statistic of what District 2 normally has. I became a mother at the age of 16. When I graduated from high school, I went to UT at Austin, and at that point, I did not understand how much debt my mom was racking up, sending two kids to college at the same time. So I decided that what I was going to do, I was going to the Army. It was the best decision of my life. I wanted it to be my career, however, I sustained an injury, and I got out of the military. And then what did I do? I came back home. And I came back home to the same residence that I still reside in today because my grandparents understood the meaning of legacy. District 2 is truly a legacy. It's what we stand on and the foundation here of the soil in District 2 is strong, it's rich, and it's vibrant. So when I stand in front of you, I stand in front of you because the legacy that was left for me by my late grandfather, the Reverend L.H. Mills, and by many of his counterparts in the ministry made sure that I understood that my foundation and where it came from. So I stand because I know District 2 is a pillar of strength. I know District 2 can have the vibrance that it always had. We just need a, a person that sits in the seat that will be consistent that will stay in the seat. It is not a platform to where I will build myself. It's not a platform that I'm looking to do two to three months. It's a platform where I will continue to do the work that District 2 needs. Our respect must be given. And the way that we get that is we get out there and we vote and we speak and we make our voices known. I've been appointed to the Martin Luther King Commission for the last four years. It has been a joy to see what we have done from just having a march that went one day out of the year to having several different things that we consistently do throughout the year. When I work with the NAACP, I work with Mr. David Sherman, who does the veteran services, and I advocate for us as veterans. I'm a survivor of domestic uh, abuse, sexual abuse, and my kids are my strength. So when I stand in front of you, you're looking at a pillar of strength that will lead this district into where we're supposed to be. And I thank you for your time, and I thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Jay. I'm Keith Tony. I'm a former councilman here in District 2. All of my literature says experience matters. I was on council for five months. I was an intern. But prior to that, I spent 15 years on the school board in the Fort Sam Houston Independent School District. Ten of those years as president of that board. Proudly, I was the first African American in the history of that district to reach that pinnacle of president. So I'm proud of that. Twice I was appointed to boards of commissions by <clears throat> District 2 council persons. Once by then councilman Joel Williams, some of you all remember Joel, and again by then councilwoman Ivy Taylor. So that's what I mean when I say experience matters. I've dealt with budgets because experience matters, and on council you will do that. I'm retired, I'm a retired civil servant. Had a pretty nice grade, so I did hire and fire. So I know how to deal interpersonally on a human resources management level with employees, with counterparts, with peers, professional peers. There's no learning curve. You don't have to worry about me getting down there and taking three months, six months to learn policies, processes, and procedures at City Hall. I know. We're ready to go. We're ready to hit the ground running. We don't have time for a learning curve. We need someone who's got big league skills because we have big league issues and big league concerns in District 2. I'm not saying that the glass is half empty. It truly isn't. I think the glass is about three quarters full, but we want to fill it up and run it over. How do we do that? Experience matters. That's how we do that. I have a bachelor's degree in government from Chapman University in Orange, California, and a master's degree in human resources management from Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. And I'm proud of those degrees, but I'm even prouder of my associate degree in speech. So you might wonder, why is he more, why is he more proud of an associate degree than a master's from Pepperdine? 
Because when I got that associate degree, I, I had just come back from Vietnam. And my mind was scrambled. But it was my wife who said, you're not, not taking any time off. You're going to get into school, and you'll get yourself together. So that associate degree was important to me. And that's why I know colleges are important. I know it's a game changer. It'll change things. I'm Keith Tony. Experience matters. I thank you for your time. I thank them for sticking to the time pretty good. That's great. Okay, um, right now we can just rush into, and uh, don't be back, don't be shy, and ask questions. I do ask that you identify who you're asking the question of. If you're asking the question for both to respond, that's fine too. But tell us who you're asking, uh, and if you're asking both or you're asking just one. So, having said that, if you want to raise who wants to kick something off, who wants to ask a question? Okay, come on up. I'm going to put you on the spot. you got to come up. <laughs> or at least right there, too. Thank you. Uh, Russell Leday, Chief Financial Officer with SAGE, San Antonio for Growth of the East Side. I'd like for both of you to share with us what do you see the top two priorities for District 2? And I'm going to give him each two minutes on, the, on each question, as long as there's not 300 questions. So the top two priorities of District 2 are definitely our crime, and then our property taxes and our youth. And so when you look at crime within District 2, I tell people in 1991 when we were at San Houston, a lot of times people don't realize that we were the generation that was tossed to the side. Because we had all of the gang violence that fed into that one school. We had the shooting that happened, and it was glorified, but never rectified. So we never had the community that came into our school to truly say, how can we combat this? What's going on? You had every part of the East Terrace, the Rigsby Courts. You had um, the Wheatley Courts. You had all of these areas feeding into this one school, and it became a cesspool and a gumbo pot. And out of that, what you're seeing today are the remnants of our children that we have that are continuing to perpetuate the cycle. And it's gotten totally out of hand because every day when we were in school, we had a moment of silence. It seemed like it was going on every week. And that is what our children are experiencing today. So we have to kind of go backwards, catch up, and come forwards. And then we must do something about our property taxes, especially with our seniors. Thank you. Same question. Okay, I see economic development and infrastructure as the two top for me. And you might wonder, why doesn't he say crime? Because I think crime is a symptom. Because people, people are hurt. And hurt people hurt people. So people need hope. They, right now they feel hopeless and helpless. So if I can't get a job, there's nobody in here. We can sit here now, we're all healthy. We're all happy, we're well fed, and guess what? And say, I would never sell drugs. I never say that. So, but we have to give them an alternative. So that's why we're working with people who can do that in the district. Give us some job training. So, you know, you know we've been discovered, so they're coming in now, all the developments are here. So here's what we're saying to them. As a condition of doing business here, in District 2, here's what we want from you, Mr. Developer. We want some job training from folks that look like us. So that's what we want from them. So we need economic development and infrastructure. That's good. That's good. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Raise your hand. Who has a question? Come on now. Barack Obama used to be famous. Come on, man. <laughs> All right, Mr. Harris. Uh, thank the gentleman from Sage for his question, and now we'll have Mr. Harry come up. Do I need the microphone? Yeah. Well, I think that this is very important, this election. Um, so this question really talks to the heart of uh, the city of San Antonio being on the list of being one of the most economically segregated uh, cities in the United States. Uh, current mayor uh, has not really at all addressed it. Uh, district 2 uh, is one of those districts that have a 
history of economic segregation. So please tell me what your plan is to uh, help to uh, get us off to the top of that list. Well, the, the, the good thing is, as council person, we don't have to do it ourselves. You know, we, we have small business organizations. We have black, just Aaron's a part of it. We have these businesses who are really ready to go. They just need somebody with political will and somebody who's going to be there and not use the, the post as a stepping stone. So you don't have to worry about me leaving to become a judge. I'm not qualified to become a judge. So I'll be there. I'll be there. We'll, we both pledge that we'll be there. So, so that's what we need is the political will to work with you. You know, we've got, we have the warriors, we have the army, if you will, in place just to work with you to really make it happen for District 2. It's happening everywhere else. It's happening everywhere else in this city. The things that District 8 take for granted and 9 and 10, we don't, we can't take for granted. As council persons, one of us is going to have to worry about <coughs> sidewalks and things for our seniors not to fall in the street while out there at Hardberger Park, they got $25 million for Dan Scott across the road. So we need somebody who can fight that crap and say, no, no, no. Because they need my vote like I need their vote. And you got to know that going in. And we'll do that. So to combat, combat the economic segregation that we have here in District 2, definitely we have a strong small business community. And going out to each one of those small businesses, because we know our small business owners are in-house. So we need to go to them and get them the certifications they need, show them how to navigate the website to become certified vendors. We have subcontractors and that's great, but we have people in our community that can be prime contractors for the city of San Antonio. It's about putting the right pieces in place and making sure that we touch everyone within our community. Because if we're not touching each and every last one of us, we're still failing our own community. Now the city of San Antonio, we know, has a population of where they don't see us. So we have to become visible for ourselves. And I've spoken to many people in our community that have come back and they are not in that price range they're used to being at when they've been other places. We have to change the rhetoric for ourselves and come back to truly working with our community, making sure that everybody has the certifications they need, making sure that they have all of their business plans in place, and then we start making sure that we give ourselves the economic advancement that we need to become a prime contractor. Thank you. Okay. We have two guys standing up now. Right. Thank you. Put a Okay, this is a general question about the city as a whole. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the police and fire department, and I would like some clarification. Now, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but their pay uh, is higher than Houston, Dallas, or Fort Worth. So the real issue is health care. And it's my understanding that they want, they're fighting for free health care. <coughs> For not only themselves but their families, and I'm wondering um, how are we to pay for that because even the federal government doesn't give free health care, not even for the employee. And I would like both of you uh, to give me your opinion on that. Yes, ma'am. So if we are to give free health care to all of our service people, we would bankrupt our city. And so what I would love to see happen is that we have partnerships. We have university health systems. We have MD Anderson. Those are things that we can partner together to get them some of the things they need health-wise instead of just continuously paying out their health care. We can have a partnership with most of the contracted doctors that we bring into the city. We can have them contracted as well with BAPC or SAMC now um, as we know it. If we start doing partnerships and start building into the resources that are coming here, instead of constantly giving out of the budget, then we start making sure that everyone is covered. But we cannot go into a city budget and pay everybody's health care, including their families, because then we'll bankrupt our whole city. So we have to start looking at other ways to make sure that our service people are cared for, because they do a job that all of us need within our community. 
So when you tap into university health systems, you tap into MD Anderson, when you have those firefighters that say, I'm having these health issues that are causing me cancerous cells that are coming into my body from taking in all of these things that we don't know what is in this fire, this atmosphere, then we can start really combating those things. But just continuously paying out even more and more, we're going to bankrupt our city and we can't afford to do that. Thank you. The Evergreen Clause is what you're referring to with fire, so I'm going to delineate between police and fire. Because police really have been to the table, and, and that's pretty much settled. So let's, let's do that first. Of all. So we're talking about fire, that's what you're talking about. The Evergreen Clause is something that is it's in a state of flux right now, but they're at the table, so that's good. Firefighters across this state have uh, a cancer rate that is about five times the normal cancer rate, which is too high. So we all, everybody in here has been touched by cancer in their families. But their rate is about five times higher. The city in 2014, actually the, the then city manager, uh, had to come kicking and screaming to buy them air cleaners for their firehouses, which we did. I was on council then, and we did vote to get them because when, when they back in, they idle. And they're, in addition to the, it, it, as Jade alluded to, the fires, you know, what's in a fire, who knows what's in it. So that's one of the things. Now, the family issue is, is the rub for them. And, and they're probably going to lose that. They're going to lose that. But for them, as first responders, we have to take care of them. Their cancer rate is extremely, extremely high across the board. And so that has to be taken care of. And the city can do it. There's money to do it. Uh, but the family is an issue that, that is going to go on property for another six months to a year. Uh, one question. We have two guys, one woman, so women are behind. Uh -huh. <laughs> women are behind. Oh, okay. oh, okay. So, um, to get things done, sometimes you have to build uh, consensus. So, how Will you um, work with the other city council members to build consensus, and while at the same time not selling District Two short? So, thank you, Ms. Joy. The way you build consensus is you truly have to get them to understand the uniqueness of District Two. A lot of times, when I speak to the council members that are on the dais, and I ask them, "What do you truly know about District Two?" And I spoke with Councilman Trevino, and I spoke with Councilwoman Gonzalez, and I spoke with Councilwoman Villagon, and I asked them, what do y'all truly know about District 2? What is the history that you know about District 2? How do you know, and what do you know about the reason why we're fighting so hard for District 2? A lot of times they'll tell me, oh, well, we just agree to disagree. I'm like, great, that, that can happen too. However, we must truly get to the root of what you know and why we're fighting so hard for what we deserve. For 20 years, I have seen District 2 be overlooked, under underserved, and we need to change the rhetoric. So now we have to sit on a diet where we need the power of six. And what that means is that when I agree to make my district stronger, I need the rest of you to agree to make my district stronger. Either you come into my district and stay a few days and stay and hear what we hear at night. Come and ride around our areas and see what we see because your area is beautiful. But we've been dilapidated because we've been overlooked. And so when you get them to understand where we are in District 2, and you get that respect that is due out of the city council member that you elect, then you start seeing a true change within District 2. And that's what we will truly do. Thank you. There's truly an interdependence. Uh, and most council persons know that. Each council person that Jada just named, I served with. Yeah. And I can tell you that they get it, that, that they need in us and we need them to get something done. And a rising tide lifts all boats. So if it helps too, it's going to help eight as well. It really will. So we need, we know that they need that. And they know what we need. And I do say this, that you can't understand District 2 by coming to the MLK march and then getting off the east side of the you can. That doesn't help. And coming to the MLK march and not even going to a food vendor and spending ten dollars that doesn't help me, my district. Because when I go to the Chavez march, I spend money. Yeah, I'll spend money, and not from any. I'm not going to spend it at McDonald's or Burger King. I'm going to go to a small vendor. 
mom and pop trying to make a living. So help us. Help us so we, we, we can work together. I've worked with those folks. And they'll work with us in most cases. And when they don't, when they don't, then we negotiate from a position of strength. There's nothing wrong with doing that. They're not used to District 2 doing that, yeah. but they'll get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the score is now tied 2-2. Two two. The women got 2, the men got 2. Uh -huh. Who's going to break the tie? Uh -huh. Raise your hand. Come on. I'm going to put the mic in your hand in a minute. Come on, raise your hand. Who's got another question? You can, I'm sure you can think of one. Reverend, Reverend Beckham, I have one. The men are now here. Uh, <laughs> the men are never here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <that's a> <laughs> Actually, I, I want to make a statement. The statement, first of all, is I am very, very honored that both of you are our final candidates because, uh, you know, I've seen campaigns since I've been in San Antonio. I think you guys have run a great campaign, and whichever one of you get elected, I think we're going to have a great representative in District 2. <laughs> so, <thank you. laughs> the question is, uh, given the fact that one of you will become our council person, and we have a runoff for the mayoral position, uh, <coughs> what kind of relationship do you anticipate having with either the current mayor or the uh, the other candidate, if he gets elected. Well, I've always had a, a positive working relationship with uh, Mayor Nirenberg. We worked together when we, we were on council together. And when I came on council, he was the first council person to invite me to lunch, as a matter of fact. The very first. And uh, I always joked with Rebecca Vivra, and I said, now, I'm in two, and you in three, and you let this guy beat you. you and he, he invited me first, so I have a good working relationship with him. I have a great working relationship also uh, with Mr. Brockhouse because Mr. Brockhouse spends a lot of time in District 2. And so I've gotten to know him as well. So I, at best, I don't anticipate any issues at all. And you brought up something about both of us being the finalists. Let me say this. If, if my count is correct, and Jada can correct me, this is our 20th form. Our 20th form. It's unheard of. Um, and I couldn't be with a better candidate, and I don't call her an opponent, I always say she's a co-candidate. We're just two candidates out here trying to do what we do. Um, and I always want to thank her publicly for being that kind of co-candidate that we can just try to look to the future for our history. Right. So when it comes to working with either our current mayor or Councilman Brockhouse if he becomes mayor, it's all about making sure that we have a cohesive working relationship. That means when I speak for my district, I need them to listen. And when they are available, they need to come to our district. That is one of the things that we have not seen consistently out of one or the other. And so you need to truly make your tread marks here to understand why District 2 is coming to you for the things that we were requesting, the things that we're asking for. And so I can truly say Councilman Brockhouse is a man of his word. If he says he's coming, he's coming. And that, for me, speaks louder than anything else. And with uh, Mayor Ron, he truly has been um, a source to where we can say, where have you been? And when you ask him these things, he'll tell you his answer. So we thank him for that. But working together is a must. And either way, we have to work hand-in-hand hand to make sure District 2 is not overlooked anymore. I got both of them beat. I had 42 of those meetings, so. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, they were running for nothing. Uh, <laughs> with the men are now here. I think we got time. Oh, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. We probably need to start wrapping it up. We have time for women to retire the game. I don't live in your district, I'm District 3. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, and this is a question for both of you, it's very important to have a professional team in place, especially when you're transitioning and you're going to be on a very tight timeline. I'd like to know, are you 
are you building that team? Have you built the team? Or are we going to continue with the people that are currently in place and that have been AIDS for 10 years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. And so, and, and I also address that question when you start looking at your boards, because that's very important who is on your boards. You know. So it's a question, but you don't want to answer. Yeah. Good right. question. Um, definitely. When I look at the Northeast office, because they have been closed, reopened, and closed again, and reopened, and so they are a part of an area of District 2 that feels totally neglected, like they don't even exist within our realm of District 2. Having that District 2 Northeast office remain open with some of the key players that are in there is a must because they know the issues, and they know the issues that have been neglected for so long, and we need to start working on those. When it comes to looking at a team and a staff, I do have my set of one of the things that we want to put in place. There's some additional pieces that our district truly needs to have in that office to make it very functional for our people that live within District 2, especially our seniors and our youth. So those are some of the things that we're going to be looking to bring into the office as well. And then um, it's just interesting that we've had this question and I've heard some of the concerns of those that are working in the office. Um, are we going to have a job? Are we going to be on? Are we going to stay on? And my key is to go in there and truly ask them face to face, what do you bring to the table? What have you done? And show me your records. Because you could have been here 30 years, but if you haven't completed anything that we need in District 2, we thank you for your service. <laughs> and then when it comes to your boards, we need people that live in District 2, that understand District 2, to sit on those boards and represent us for District 2. Because if you don't live here, you don't truly understand what it means and what it is that we're fighting for, and we truly need to make that change. Thank you. Uh, the answer is, um, we know pretty much who we want in place. We've had those conversations, and we know who will be gone, and there are some people who will be gone. They don't know it yet, but they'll be gone <laughs> uh, because they have to go. Because we're gonna we're gonna change things for our district. Even down to something that seems as simple as answering the phone when it rings in the office. You know, we're going to be very professional about customer service. These are our customers. I don't care if she has a PhD or GED or nothing. She hasn't gone to school. We had that opportunity. She's our customer. She's our client. He's our client. We're going to be professional. You're going to think you're calling Frost Bank because I want that for our folks. I want us to get, this is our new normal, to get accustomed to professionalism when you call your district two office. And for someone to timely get back to you and not say, we call you back. See, first time I hear that, I, I don't count very well, and I don't play baseball, so you only get two strikes. <laughs> That's it. That's it. We want professionalism. We deserve no less boards and commissions. You got to live in the district. You have to understand the district. Okay? You're not going to because I don't care if you're my cousin. I'm not hiring you and then poking them because y'all were raised together. No. It's not happening. It's not happening. We're going to scrub the application very closely. To make sure you really want to be there. You really want, you're not there for the money, nothing wrong with money, we all like it. But I want you to really have a sense of commitment to District 2. What comes the last two questions there? And from the looks of things, the women win. My name is Rose Bean, and I own several properties in District 2. So I heard both of you all make a statement, and I'm not buying for a job for retirement. However, comma, I do believe that you can, and that's not my question. I'm going somewhere with my question. But I do believe that you can have a lot of a desire for District 2, and I live in District 2. I firmly believe that. Why? Because I pay a lot of taxes in District 2. So that's that's free and it's no charge. However, my question is yes. Thank you. my question is in terms of zoning, um, if there was just one thing you could change about zoning in district two, what would it be and why? That's a hard one. Uh, just quickly before you 
I did con uh, contact uh, Commissioner Tommy Calvert, uh, Precinct 4. He told me next year, I believe, it'll be starting. You will no longer have to vote in your precinct. You'll be able to vote anyway. Yes. yes. That's, uh, and that's me praising Commissioner Calvert. <laughs> so, but let me ask, let me ask you. Uh, so in case they didn't know that, that's pretty new. Most people didn't know that. With me, one thing we need to have is make sure that who we put on these boards and commissions really know what they're talking about. So that when someone like you who's a property owner, especially multi-property owner, that you're not, that the, the zoning laws aren't so onerous to you, and they are right now, and I understand that. In some cases, you end up with something besides you you didn't want. In other cases, you want something there. The, the neighbors may want something there. You pulled them. You want to put something there. Zoning says no. Zoning says no. Zoning's not supposed to be a big brother. It's supposed to work with you. And that's what we would do. So zoning is always an issue, but we have to have the right people in place. And I'm not sure that we have had recently for, for the district, for business people like yourself and for people who own property in the district. And so that's number one, is that we want somebody who's there, who understands it's not about you and what you can potentially get out of it, but it's about folks like Ms. Bean and the rest of us when you make these zoning decisions. That, that don't have to be onerous, and they really don't have to be just common sense. So that's number one, is that we want to make sure we have the right people in place. Sure. Um, yes, ma'am, Ms. Bean, thank you so much. And so when it comes to zoning, it's truly about looking at what we put in a multi-level family unit when it's a residential unit compared to a commercial unit. And so when you start looking at zoning, you want to make sure that you don't have your commercial and your residential and your residential that fits into your multi-level because then we start having a cluster of areas that are congested. And we need to make sure that we have that zoning in place to make sure our areas are covered. And because we're so into looking into density within the city of San Antonio, making sure that we don't just plop a multi-level family unit in the middle of a residential unit would be wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I, I, there's another question. I'll take this. You go to top it off. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is based on the independent vote of Art Hall uh, on the Chick fil A issue ending that conversation. His vote ended that conversation, and the legislature has now addressed the issue by saying that religious freedoms. Um, when it comes to city contracts, or um, or or fall under our constitutional rights, and so I want to know what it is that each of you would do um, as you have to readdress this issue in council regarding our religious freedoms, as well as what we're going to do with our airport leadership, our airport uh, use concessions uh, because of this overturned by the legislature. That's a good question. Okay. With so many issues in District 2, sometimes I sit and wonder why we having this conversation about chicken sandwiches. However, when you look at Chick-fil-A, you have to really start looking at the fact that they are franchises. And so when you have franchises, are we going to penalize each and every franchise owner? When you look into the contracts, the city has specific guidelines that each company must follow in order to get those contracts in the airports and in any other area that they're looking to do business with the city. So we're going to change the rhetoric for just this one company because the head of this company and not this one particular franchise owner are different from ours. When I look into my family, I look at the dynamics of my family and a lot of times coming from a Baptist family, when you have those issues of different ideas of what we think about religiously. We are not looking at that in our contract. That is not what we have to say. Well, our belief is not your belief, and your belief is not my belief, and so we don't want you here. If we're going to talk about an all-inclusive city, we need to start looking at exactly how are we looking at our, our contracts and follow those guidelines to the T. Thank you. All right. Um, one last call for questions. One last call for questions. <laughs> Can I add to this just before you answer? Just knowing that the legislature has made a decision that's higher than any contract, 
that you currently have. So address that from what you would do to change. So working with our state legislature, we have to get them to understand that their state, their city, and our city contract and our legislature need to work hand in hand to make that happen. And so I would love to see how they would come in and help us to develop our contracts to meet the guidelines that they're looking for us to have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. Mm -hmm. All right. The this was never about chicken sandwiches. Right. That's incidental right. Right. to this. This is about religious freedom and municipal overreach. Yes. Yeah. This was municipal overreach at its worst. How are you going to tell this business that they have to not close on Sunday? That's their business model, if that's what they want to do. And it's not going to hurt them economically. Chick-fil-A, if you ever try to get in a drive through <laughs> they're doing just fine. And, and, and the consumer should have a right for six days a week at least to choose Chick-fil-A if you're at the airport. And what has happened is not only the legislature gotten involved, uh, the Supreme Court, Texas, has gotten involved, and now the FAA is involved. So what can happen is this city can be painted with the brush of we are unfriendly to businesses that don't fit within our sphere. That's not good. No. That's not good. I, I have a lot of diversity in my family and in my friends. I don't choose my friends by who they live with, who they sleep with, or what they eat or what they wear. I don't care. If you're good to me, I'm good to you. Yeah. So that's what this is about. It's about overreach by a municipality, this city, and religious freedom, or lack thereof. Okay, Okay, I'm wrapping it up. There's no more questions. You already have your chance. Um, yeah, the women won, by the way. Um, so, uh, but I didn't have a question. The moderator for both candidates. We uh, we were we removed that racist statue from Travis Park. The Confederate statue we needed to go. Yeah. We got twenty-two thousand signatures to remove that statue. Uh, I respect Ivy Taylor a lot, but we fell out over that issue. And uh, our group won. We got those statutes removed. We are in the process of looking to see if there's any other. The county already removed all of theirs. The city, it's got the one on our travel park. And there may be some others. So I wanted to ask them what are the position on Confederate statues, which, in my opinion, represent slavery in the city of San Antonio? <laughs> All right, if Robert E. Lee just replaced Robert E. Lee with Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington just say, during the Civil War, said, I hereby declare war on the United States of America. Will there be any statues to Booker T. Washington? No. Not a one. Let's say this now, and we have to understand this. Robert E. Lee was an insurgent. He declared war on an established government of this country. That's what he did. And it wasn't economic. Well, it was economic because who was doing the economy? Yeah. Slaves. So that's why I said that statue needed to go. The county started taking the plaques down immediately. But the city dragged their feet. See, so I don't owe anybody that's a descendant of, of Robert E. Lee anything at all. Anything at all. The best thing Robert E. did, Lee did for us was gave us Arlington National Cemetery. He didn't give it. We took it. We took it because we won. Now, I understand he was a general. And he was an effective general. But he was an effective general for the other side, for the enemy. He turned against the established government of this country. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I brought a bronze star. We were Vietnam. So I didn't turn against my nation. Robert E. Lee did. The fact that he's white makes no difference to me. If it were Booker T. Washington, I'd say the same thing. Same thing. Come on. He turned against it. Yeah. And why did he do it? To maintain an established <laughs> rule of law that was illegal and immoral, and we call it enslavement. <laughs> That's why he did it. So take the statues down. Don't put them in a museum. Bury them for all eternity. I'm tired of hearing about Robert E. Lee. <laughs> Me too. Ah, well
when it comes to our history, which District 2, I remember the times that we were in school, and our children don't even know the history of what we truly had to go through. If you look at it, even when we think about the Hay Street Bridge, and when you sit down with someone, you ask them, you bought this land. Great. But do you know the history of why people are upset with you about the bridge and what you're doing with this land? It was our bridge, literally, to cross from one area into another. And we had to bridge those roads and those rails that we weren't accepted into. My mother told me when she got here from Victoria, Texas, and she went to the hemisphere, they still had the water fountains that had colored and white. And in her mind, she was like, we are still living in a land where we will not be respected because by the color of our skin, we are deemed less than. And when you put up an image in front of a child and you don't explain to them why people are really fighting to have this removed, because we want you to understand as little black girls and little brown girls and little breeds of our history. Why do your ancestors say no more when we have to face what we already went through when we become stronger in what we are doing? And if you want to continue to remind us what you did to us, then maybe we should remind you how we built where you are standing. And if we start changing that and start teaching our youth why we are fighting to have these remnants taken down, why we need to have this erased from what you mean to be the best part of America and start truly teaching them why we decided that we needed to stand because our ancestors bled, then that's when we start taking our power back to help them understand that we don't need to face something that we've already been through when we've overcome it. So thank you. Okay, um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to get one more question. That's it. Uh, and, 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 no. She wanted to ask a follow up. I'm going to let her do it because of the women won anyway. So this is not going to change the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Once again, I need clarification because it's my understanding regarding Chick fil A that it had nothing to do with gay rights, that it had to do with revenue, with the city, uh, with Chick-fil-A being closed on Sunday, the city was losing money. So, can you please, both of you, clarify that for me? That was Ron's lie. <laughs> we all know that the city of San Antonio, that the city of San Antonio, we've had other businesses that have been in the airport that was closed on Sunday. So that is really not an issue. We've had other businesses that closed on Sunday. So Chick-fil-A being closed on Sunday is not a first and it won't be a last. But it was truly about one that stepped up and said, because they... Um, give money to conversion therapy and because they are not going to be open on that Sunday is how they try to intertwine it. But however, it was truly about looking at our NDO and how it was going to represent the communities that come through our airport more than it was about economics. That, 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 that's a lie. It's, it's a lie. That's just something that they came up with after the fact, when the backlash came. Oh, 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 it's economic. It's not economic at all. If you go to San Francisco, <laughs> guess who owns most of the Chick fil A franchises in San Francisco? Gay people. Chick fil A, if you're going to make money for them, they don't care. The conversion therapy thing, I think, is stupid. It's not therapy and it doesn't convert anybody. If, you take, if I go and kidnap my 38 year old son to make him believe a certain way, that's kidnapping. That's not any kind of therapy. So I don't agree with that. But this was about an assault on religious freedom. Yeah, that's it, 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 the city's not worried about losing revenue from Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if they worried about that, they could give me some of that money for that $25 million land bridge in Harbor. They didn't care how that went through. Scully got her $75,000 gold parachute when she left, so that'd be money for that. So they, the, the, the money's there. If this was all about just trying to punish this company uh, for that reason. And the council person in District 1 is the guy who led the charge 
Then the mayor jumped on board. Then the mayor said, oh, I better retract. I forgot I'm in the middle of a dog fight. So now I got to retract. The guy who won, he's okay. He won heavily, so he's bad. So the mayor said, I got to retract now. So what do I do? Oh, this is about economics. No, it's not about economics. Not at all. It's not about economics at all. That's just a political lie to cover up the real reason that they made that terrible, terrible decision. Great, great response. Um, Renee, how much time we got left? Trying to wrap up. Can I do a follow-up? Yeah, time to wrap up. 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 Okay. Well, we want to thank uh, two candidates for being here. By the way, we need to thank them for a very, for really a pretty civil campaign. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, not unlike me, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think they did, they did do it. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, anytime you're running in a political office, you always have to bear the burden of that running for that office. And that means criticism here, there, everywhere. It also means thanks. So we do want to thank them for what they're doing. Um, and we're looking forward to the election, which is on uh, Saturday at the 8th. You can still vote early tomorrow and Tuesday. So I'm going to give them one minute closing remarks. Um, and so let's do that. Dana? Thank you, Mr. Collins. And thank you all for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Ms. Jordan, for the invite. Um, as I stand in front of you, we all know that this runoff means a lot for our district. It is the seat that looks like us and speaks for us. It's the one that has the president's on city council. And so when I stand in front of you, I stand in front of you because when I leave from that dais, I come back home to District 2 where I lay my head. And I look at my kids and I say, I did this because... Your mama was the statistic that wasn't supposed to make it. Your mama was the one that they told, you a little black girl from Sam Houston with a baby at 16, you won't never be nothing. When I stood and I decided to do this, I did this because I want them to know no matter what anybody says, thinks, or believes, you believe in yourself. Because where you come from will not determine where you're going. And so when I stand in front of you, I stand in front of you because I don't have to be appointed because I'm anointed in order to do some things here in District 2. So I humbly ask that you get out and vote, but I do ask that you vote for me. And I ask that you vote for a change for District 2. I ask that you vote for something that will build District 2. And I thank you for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. And thank you again, Jada. We, we, Jada and I spent a lot of time together. <laughs> Believe me. We spent a lot of time together. And, and it's been nothing but a joy from the very beginning. Even though uh, sometimes I make jokes that may be a little, what is it, off color. <laughs> and Jada, we usually sit beside each other so she can she look at me and go, uh-uh. Uh -uh. <laughs> so, so she's kept me straight. This is very important. We lose this seat this time. We may never get it again. Let's just, can we be up front? We all family, right? Let's be 100 about it. It's not going to happen again. It's not going to happen again. We'll lose it. It's gone. Demographically, we're shifting. Yeah. Was that politically correct enough? We're shifting. So we better be really, really conscious about what we do and how we vote. Because it's going to make a difference for our grandchildren. <laughs> District 2 is the shining city on the hill for me. It's not a stepping stone. I'm not looking to do anything else. I'm 67 years old. I'm comfortable. Thank God for Social Security. <laughs> My wife and I are doing well. Got her military retirement, woo -woo. my disability, <laughs> her disability, <laughs> uh, so we're good. So this is about commitment for me. I can be comfortable. And when I finish this, I'm going home. I'm done. I'll be available to be in the community, but for political office, I'm done. I just want to help. Vietnam taught me that. I said, Lord, if you let me get out of this alive, when five people got killed to the left of me that day, one of whom was a good friend of mine from Alliance, Ohio, we came up together. I said, I will serve you the rest of my life. Not in the, not in the pulpit like my grandfather, but, but I will, I'll have, live a life of service. So please let me continue to live a life of service. I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you so much.
Would you like to start? Yeah. All right. She's gracious. Very gracious. Okay. Well, we want to thank all y'all for being here. Uh, spend some time talking to the candidates one on one. And we thank Ms. McGee for doing her duty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good luck in the future, and uh, I'm glad to have been a moderator between you all, too. Thank you very much. Thank you.